Thank you, everybody. Thank you, HelloFresh, your, the whole team. We've got seven senior leaders here. That's insane. Um, really excited about that. Um, you know, what what's going to happen here is team's going to present, and then we'll have uh, an extended Q and A after that. Uh, if everybody for your Q and A can actually put it into the Zoom Q and A, not into the Zoom chat, um, that is helpful. So that way, it's one centralized place. Please feel free to use the chat. Um, as we're going along and, and things like that, uh, we love for people to connect with each other and talk and, and have that, that connection. That's the whole point of community. But um, I, you know, it, it makes it much easier for the presenters if we can actually stick that stuff into Q&A. And you can actually vote up and uh, questions as to which ones you really want them to answer as well. So that Q&A function really does help people. So uh, I'm gonna shut up now. Uh, really excited for, for you guys to, to go through, or you folks to go through this and, and present. So um, I'm here to help, but if there's uh, outside of that, I'll, I'll basically be on silent. So thanks so much. Cool. Um, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for the nice introduction. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Christoph and I'm working here as a Senior Director of Data uh, since basically two and, more than two and a half years. And actually, all of us are very excited today to have this opportunity to present HelloFresh's transition to a data mesh. And because this transition actually involves a lot of changes in a lot of different kind of areas, specifically from organizational changes, architectural changes, and also the way how we are thinking about things. Um, because of this reason, we have a huge group, as Scott has mentioned, basically from a lot of uh, representatives uh, from different areas here at HelloFresh, from engineering through, uh, through management and product. And we're trying to give you a very broad understanding of our journey for, uh, uh, at HelloFresh around data mesh uh, intentionally, because what we're trying to do is um, basically giving you an understanding of the activities that we have kicked off as basically a good starting point for a fruitful discussion in the end. But before I start basically talking about our journey, let me quickly introduce you to HelloFresh. So HelloFresh is one of the most popular meal kits uh, in the world. We had basically more than 200, uh, almost 240 million meals delivered and have over 7 million active customers just in the first quarter of this year. Our mission is to change the way people eat forever. And we are achieving that by providing every household with amazing homemade, meal, uh, homemade meals, removing the hassle. Um, and we are doing this by basically everything that is required is already carefully planned, sourced and delivered straight to your, to your front door. And our lean and innovative supply chain focuses on reducing the food waste, carbon emission, optimized packaging, and promotes local ingredient sourcing. However, HelloFresh is actually far more than just a meal kit provider. We have a, grow, um, we have a growing diverse offering based with these brands here like Green Chef, Everplate, and Factor, uh, who are targeting a variety of consumer needs. And our vision is to be the world's leading fully integrated food solution group. And the interesting part of that is that data actually plays a very crucial role in this journey. And we have identified data as a key strategic asset for us, for our sustainable growth and actually to accelerate our success. To just give you a couple of examples here, we are leveraging data to increase our customer's experience. We are optimizing our marketing spend with data and we are lowering our overall cost structure. So if you want to learn more and maybe basically after this, uh, uh, after this talk, uh, you're a little bit more excited about the work that we're doing, please reach out to us individually, connect to us uh, via LinkedIn and basically visit our career page. We have a, a really huge number of exciting roles across the entire globe and actually also in a lot of different roles. So now I'm handing over to Harry, our lead data architect, who will walk us through a quick history of data and our motivation actually for the data mesh. Thank you, Christoph. So uh, the data infrastructure at uh, HelloFresh has organically grown over the years. At first, uh, the operational data plane, we had two operational monoliths, uh, one for the back end and one for the uh, front end. On the analytical plane, we had uh, started off with uh, just uh, some simple uh, Google sheet based uh, reporting. Obviously, this was not a scalable approach. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then over a period of time, we quickly created our data lake on Hadoop, but it was it very much uh, reflected our operational uh, monoliths. Uh, next slide. Uh, following this, uh, we established some rough modeling uh, inside the data lake and had some materialized views for the presentation layer. And uh, uh, um, so uh, next slide. 
um, many organizations have achieved success in a, a hub and spoke uh, implementation on the analytical plane, which involves a data lake followed by a, a data warehouse with uh, model data. However, we at HelloFresh use uh, Impala uh, as the data warehouse itself, uh, which uh, is kind of like, I mean, it, it, it's a query engine rather, right? So uh, this organic development did not yield favorable results and uh, has led us to a situation wherein uh, we have a central uh, monolith for all domains, uh, loose Kimball based modeling standards, no uniformity, uh, materialized use for the presentation layer, duplication of effort, and uh, this in turn has affected our uh, ability to scale, uh, created uh, siloed data and teams. Uh, there are a lot of uh, missing feedback loops, uh, complex environments, uh, which are technically disparate in nature. And finally, this also has led to slow uh, innovation and uh, lack of trust. Uh, next slide, thank you. An ideal data mesh uh, implementation uh, for us looks something like this, like each uh, individual should have, uh, individual domain should have uh, autonomy in ingesting their own uh, sources enabled by a data hub uh, construct, which would uh, provide capabilities like ingestion as a service, compute as a service, and orchestration as a service, abstracted by some level of uh, meta programming. Uh, the data hub should also be enabled by a data catalog, which should allow for data discoverability. Each domain should ingest uh, the data into their own uh, data lakehouse construct, which in turn will inundate multiple uh, data products. Each lakehouse would be connected to each other by conformed dimensions to allow for cross-domain uh, data products uh, to be built. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we believe in a data mesh uh, or a data in a mesh uh, or in a bounded context, uh, um, a data doesn't live on its own. Uh, use cases which require data from multiple disparate uh, domains need these individual bounded contexts to be context aware of each other. Uh, this would be achieved by building some kind of uh, uh, build structure, uh, bridge structures, uh, building hyper-specialized cubes and uh, some conformed dimensions as we saw on the previous slide. That being said, I will now hand over to Christoph once again to talk of, uh, about our data mesh approach so far. Thanks, Harry. Um, let me walk you through what we have done so far, and I will just touch a couple of topics um, that will actually, we have a little bit more um, uh, to talk about basically uh, from the different presenters here. So we started with establishing end-to-end -end cross functional teams with data engineers, with data scientists and data analysts that they are able to take ownership of the data assets in their domain. And the first thing that what we have done is we conducted a deep dive to define, identify and distribute data ownership across all the data assets followed actually by a technical assessment, which led to a backlog of activities to modernize our data assets. In addition, we introduced the role of a data product manager in the data consuming functions to help actually managing the data ownership from those domains. And actually to establish at least kind of minimal standards in, in this distributed setup and best practices, um, we also as, um, have created data chapters for the different functions and they're also supporting our individuals with their career progression. In order to enable interoperability between the distributed domains, we also established a global central data management and governance function, which is responsible for establishing processes and uh, policies how, by how we are actually managing our data, which in turn then basically satisfying the overall needs of HelloFresh. Finally, what we have done is our original central data warehouse team, which we are actually building pipelines in the first place, we turned the team into a data platform team, which now is providing education tools and infrastructure to the teams to remove the domain agnostic work. To give you a short, not extensive, uh, exhaustive, but actually a list of key challenges that we have faced. So distributing data assets highlighted from our side, actually, that we have a knowledge gap in the different domains around how we're accessing data, how we are managing data, how we're creating data, and how we're consuming data. And we tackled that from two different fronts. Number one was uh, hiring, and please, again, uh, visit our career page. Um, but secondly, also what we have done, we implemented a comprehensive data literacy program internally, and Natalie will basically give us more information at the end about that one. Something that is also 
maybe maybe known, but it's, I think it's very versed to make it explicit, is that the data mesh is a model of scale. No one actually starts with implementing a data mesh in a, in a greenfield. And HelloFresh came to that point where we lost trust in our data and slowed down innovation. And that means that you're typically actually uh, accumulating a lot of technical deaths over the year that you have to deal with. As mentioned, we spend a significant amount of time simplifying, stabilizing our old tech depth, uh, creating a vision for the future and proactively drive modernization instead of just lift and shifting our, our, our current uh, technical real estate. The last point is about lack of product thinking. I think product thinking always kind of starts with ownership and ownership uh, to some extent or uh, on a certain definition means that we have the responsibility to host and serve data assets um, with a minimum acceptable technical standard. And under that definition, the process was actually not about transferring ownership, but in most cases to establish ownership. And I'm highlighting that because transition erroneously suggests that data sets were owned before, but what was actually the reality is that the data platform team had the capabilities to make changes to all the data pipelines, but the analytics teams were always the ones who had the business understanding and the use, kind, uh, use case behind that. So we stand, spend time on establishing ownership, introducing definitions of data quality, data contracts, SLOs, and we kicked off, a remo uh, kicked off remodel activities to address the stakeholder needs. And now I would like to hand over to Mario, who will give us some insights about our self serve platform. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Christoph already talked about the importance of, of a self serve data platform as an enabler for data mesh and for individual domain data teams. So what I would like to do now is um, I would like to walk you through an example of how we have implemented that at HelloFresh. So next slide. So in particular, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the beginning of the data value creation chain. So like I want to show you how we support the main data teams to to uh, publish their raw data. Um, so to get get started with becoming coming data producers. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so when you start um, distributing the data ingestion task um, to domain teams, you will encounter two main problems. So one is of course, that you require specialized tech knowledge in the team, but there are also, ma uh, but there, but there are also many non-technical cross-cutting concerns the team does not necessarily should be dealing with. So let's have a look at how we try to solve this here at HelloFresh. Next. Um, so of course, the obvious solution here is to, to have a self-serve data ingestion service um, that enables teams to publish their raw data into, into a data lake. Um, so that should be a service where, where data producers only need to add a configuration file to register a new ingestion job. So this is what I mean with, with self-serve here. Um, and of course that service also should enable uh, federated computational governance. And I have put uh, computational in brackets here because that is something where we're not quite there yet, um, but I will talk about this in, in, in more detail in a minute uh, about how, how we approach that. So something I would like to point out here is that we intentionally started with a centralized data ingestion service. So um, because we did not want to overwhelm the individual teams with having to deal with infrastructure in this stage, but we, from the beginning, uh, we plan to switch to a more decentralized approach once um, the uh, our our data organization is mature enough to to handle that. So, um, so let's dive a little deeper into those non-tech cross-cutting concerns and our our approach to governance. Christoph. So now I want to start with data data privacy here because that is. It's a complex topic and individual teams are easily overwhelmed by it. Um, and in my experience, when that happens, teams either ignore the topic uh, altogether or completely overview. So our approach to solving that is, um, Christoph, is twofold. So on one hand, uh, we support the teams with a central policy or guideline to help them understand the, the regu regulatory requirements um, and what is expected from them as, as data producers. On the other hand, we provide, again, an easy to use self-serve configuration interface to define, um, for instance, anonymization rules. So our data ingestion service then stores two copies of the data, one raw and one anonymized. 
the anonymized copy can be accessed by everyone, um, while the raw copy, of course, has strict access controls. So the only thing a data producer needs to do is to edit the configuration file and that our, our data ingestion service is taking care of the rest. So the takeaway here is that um, the domain team in the end is responsible for managing data privacy for the data they publish. So they own that, but they get the support uh, they need uh, through policies and self-serve tooling so that this is not a uh, overwhelming task for them. So it's actually a bit of a, becomes a bit of a no-brainer. Um, so let's talk about another example, uh, yet a similar one, um, data quality. So um, one problem with data quality is that it is, um, that there's no consistent understanding uh, of it across the organization. Um, so what one team may consider to be high quality may be barely acceptable for another team. So and again, we're trying to solve this uh, with a combination of uh, policy and self-serve tooling, uh, Christoph. <laughs> Um, so a policy that helps teams to understand what the organization expects from a high quality data product and tooling again that makes it easy to to implement and monitor those expectations. So um, again, we have the this twofold approach here of uh, support through policy and tooling, uh, but the responsibility of implementing um, implementing it lies with the team. So uh, last but not least, let's take a look at yet another example of what teams have to consider if they want to publish, publish their data. Um, that is discoverability of the data, of course. Um, and let's think about discoverability in the context of a, of a data catalog here. So and unfortunately, today, keeping the data catalog up to date still involves um, significant manual work at HelloFresh. And the obvious solution here, Christoph, um, is, is of course, automation, but also um, uh, for the parts that cannot be automated. So the, 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 the manually curated content you wanna you wanna provide to to the data consumers, we provide an interface so the teams can manage that um, in the same repository. Of the product. So that is one example of a service that we are offering as the platform team that enables individual teams to become efficient data producers. Um, relieving them from, from all the heavy lifting so that they can focus on, um, on solving their business problems. Um, and with that, I would like to hand over to Surya and Sharif, uh, who will be talking about the perspective of an individual domain data team. All right. Thank you, Mario. So let me first give you a brief introduction to what we do in the supply chain management of HelloFresh. Next slide, please. Um, in the supply chain, we take care of everything that is related to the physical box. And the life cycle of a box starts with product creation. What means in particular, designing our weekly menus and the recipes that customers can choose on a weekly basis. Then once we know what recipes customers want for the week, comes the sourcing phase, where we order the ingredients from our suppliers for the boxes. Once we have our supplies, we go into production where we prepare, prepare and pack the boxes at our distribution centers in the most possible efficient way. And when the boxes are ready, we work with logistics partners or use our own fleet to deliver these boxes to our customers. And finally, we gather feedback from our customers about our product or system with any requests they may have. And as you can assume, those are very important topics and really key to the business. And that is why we have an analytics team which tries to design the supply chain in the best possible and efficient way by data analysis. So in this figure, I would, I would like to show how the SCM analytics team makes use of the services provided by the self-serve data platform. So during our data serving process from ingesting data from different sources to a consumable data product, we make use of several services. We use the ingestion service, which Maria just mentioned, which makes it very easy to ingest data from various sources. We have a service to spin up an EMR cluster very quickly and easily to do data transformations via Spark. We have a service to spin up an Airflow instance fast and easily for the orchestration of the transformations. And finally, also services for alerting and monitoring of the pipelines via Prometheus and Profana. So that we have in the end, a consumable data product, which then can be also used from other domain teams as a start to create their own data product. 
And it's pretty important for the data products of the supply chain that they are trustworthy, reliable, and stable. Not only for the supply chain of the data, not only for the data products of the supply chain, of course, but in the supply chain, it's very important that the consumers can really rely on, on the data. And for that, in addition, we have CICD with a high test coverage in place. And we also plan to implement data quality checks very soon. And now Surya gives us an insight about the data product. Thank you, Sharif. So before I dive in on an example of a data product and supply chain, so I want to share with you our definition of a data product. So this definition is, of course, evolving. But as we learn and improve, uh, we, we will change it. Um, as of now, we landed on this definition, which is that a data product is a product whose primary objective is to leverage on data to solve customer problems. Next slide, please. So that being said, what is an example of a problem that we're trying to solve? So you already had an introduction to our supply chain at HelloFresh from Sharif, but as you can imagine, there are lots of things that can go wrong before our boxes are safely delivered to our customers. And one of the problems that we have is that we have fluctuating numbers of HelloFresh orders on a weekly basis. And we prepare our orders, or our boxes against this number of orders. So if we underprepare, we can have a shortage of uh, ingredients, shortage of um, uh, materials for our boxes. And this puts pressure on our suppliers and ourselves. And eventually, it can lead to unhappy customers who do not get the ingredients or the worst case scenario, they do not even get their boxes for the week. So conversely, if we over-prepare, this leads to physical and financial waste. If we ordered too much ingredients from our suppliers, and if we have too many people, let's say, on standby uh, at our distribution centers. And obviously, this also impacts our sustainability goals negatively as well. So we don't want to under-order or over, under-prepare or over-prepare. So next slide, please. And that being said, our solution is to have uh, a forecasting uh, to forecast demand on a weekly basis. So we apply data science to predict the number of boxes and recipes that will be ordered weeks in advance as accurately as possible. So the way this product works is that it mainly uses, uses the historical data of our orders and the current status of our customer subscription, whether they are active, paused, reactivated, or, or even cancelled. Next slide. And once this product was developed, and created. It wasn't just done and dusted and, and letting it run. Uh, we also think about constantly evolving the product. And for that, we have to think about how our end users consume the product. If you can imagine across the supply chain, we have different stakeholders that apply the forecast in different ways. Those in procurement might use it differently from those who are in logistics or in customer care. So we developed the product roadmap, in, in this case, demand forecasting, with uh, keeping in mind the end users who need and consume uh, the product and the impact that it has on, on the business. Next slide. And taking care of the data product also means taking care of the quality of the data that goes into it. As you know, a data product is only as good as the data that goes into it. So at HelloFresh, we do our best to track the lineage of our data products and ensure quality of the data according to these six dimensions with the end goal of increasing adoption and trust in the data product. Next, we have Pedro who will, from experimentation who will go deeper into uh, applying this data product as a mindset. Great, thank you, Surya. So hi, everybody. So in experimentation, you can imagine that we are an aggregated domain, right? So we require a lot of data from different sources. So we're gonna explore a little bit deeper. How can we actually be like after the data producers, how can we enrich and keep evolving with the data product? So next slide, please. So first let's talk about experimentation at HelloFresh, right? So our goal as a team is to advance the velocity and quality of experimentation to make uh, data-driven decisions. So we have a process that we normally use for experimentation with four phases. So we create a concept of a, of a experiment. We try to measure like what is the hypothesis that we're trying to see and how do we want to measure change. And we design the experiences, right? So this means that the, uh, we, dis we take graphical design, we take all the uh, design flow changes and everything related to it. 
And we launch and monitor this experiment. So this means data collection and trying to analyze them as soon as the data is arriving. And then we have like analysis and results that is this happening as, as soon as we get data. But also we want to basically store the results from experiment to be used in, reuse in the future. So you can see that we have a design change, feature flow change, or even price change. This is what we try to test all the time. And we do it by using advanced statistics, automation, integration, and data plus insights, right? So this is far. So um, as you can see, like experimentation seems like a simple task, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of process. So I want to talk, guide you through like how thinking in, in like data product has helped us. And this is the old process to onboard a KPI into experimentation. So you collect data, but you also need to understand if you are impacting a KPI or not. So initially, a team submits a KPI request, and then the experimentation team goes and try to understand that metric, right? Like basically sit with the team and we try to get, gather the requirements. Then there is an implementation in code and was mostly an ad hoc SQL uh, in this case. Then there is a validation process between the teams. And you can imagine that different teams can have different conventions, different namings or different practices. And this was a back and forth communication that was you know, going to implementation back to validation uh, multiple times. And finally, we get a available data product. And you can see like the difficulties that we have like duplication of effort, data and compute, especially like, you know, two teams are involved. We are like re-implementing some data because we have like different naming conventions or looking for different patterns in the data. Also, you can imagine that two implementations lead to inconsistency and quality concerns, right? It's like why the number is not exactly the one I see here or why are you considering the filter versus another one? So all these kind of problems were arising. And then goes the question about ownership, right? Like who owns the final, the metric? Because it's different from the original, but the experimentation team is not like fully aware of the domain to uh, fully own the, the metric. If you click, please, uh, Christoph. So an, an interesting point is, whoops, yeah, that I will use these uh, dots to talk about teams. And the green dot is the domain team and the blue dot is the experimentation team. So you can imagine that the experimentation team is like involved in the full process since the KPI request until the delivery. So this very more like uh, resembles a lot when we were looking at the data products, like, you know, like the monolithic architecture going back to one team being the bottleneck and we really want to change that. So next slide, please. So that is to think into data products and seeing experimentation as a data product that it's highly connected. So when we try to frame it as a data product, we see the experimentation team and the domain teams, right? And the experimentation data, it has one interesting purpose. That is who is exposed to which experiment when? This is the, the question that we, that we try to answer with the, our data. But the domain team also has expertise in the domain. They own their data product, like we saw before, and they should provide a compatible schema like um, Harry was uh, telling us earlier. And their the data product, has the, the, the answers the following question, like what is the value of a KPI per user who at a point in time when? So, and this green line that we see is a domain boundary, click please. And it's interesting because if we are into this data mesh community, you will see like a domain boundary means that we require input and output ports, right? Talking about like input and output ports in the data products. And just to do a refresher an input port is the code that handles the input data, right? So, and an output port is like this polyglot interface that is addressable, discoverable, and all these properties we already know. So just because we think in this way, and we see that there is a way that we can handle by a code connecting to other data products and basically create a new domain product. Next slide, please. So this is an oversimplification, but uh, to, to explain the idea. So like if we see again a, a SQL file, right? Now we have like who, which, who are exposed to which experiment when, and you can find all the elements. And you can see that we're using just a, a join in this case. And we say, you know, tell me the user, tell me the, the range of time, or I will tell you the range of time of experiment. And then you will put your formula, your metric value. And using this um, approach now looks very standard, right? So instead of having ad hoc sequels all the time, we're starting to standardize the way we approach uh, the metrics. So you can provide a KPI configuration file. You don't need to write the query over and over again. You just need to write the pieces that you need to connect. In this case, what is the data product that we will be using, the user and the time fields. 
and then your formula for the metric. And this is interpreted by your ex uh, statistical engine. So this is interesting because not necessarily is a query what it's running, but it's interpreted and we can actually plug in and, and deliver many metrics. And this is when we see like the input port, right? So this is when we see the concept, like the, the code that handles all this configuration is our input port. And now people can actually like plug in metrics into experimentation. So next slide, please. So now this is the new process that, that we see in experimentation. So now that a team has a data product available for a KPI. And if you want to track a metric, you're already probably defining the metric before you, you decide you want to experiment it. So you already have the data product available. Finally, you internally, like your team can create a configuration file and that one can be tested locally and independently, right? We already saw that because we have these connectors and we have all like input and output ports and polyglot interfaces, you can run tests on your side. Also at the domain data team then submits the configuration file and finally, the validation happens between teams and the KPI is available. And the difference we see just by changing the way we were approaching the problem is like now there is independence between teams. So multiple teams can actually be focusing on delivering the best quality for their metrics. And there is a collaboration. They also contribute to the experimentation platform. Also, we see a huge increase in trust, quality, and lineage, right? And this happens because now we have in metadata in all this configuration metadata, where is the data coming from? What is the data product associated if this data product is also catalog or not? And now we have, you know, what is basically the principle of a data match that is a distributed domain ownership. And if you click now, please, you will see like, now the situation means that the teams can self on board. You see that we only go into the, into the last step like experimentation and the teams can advance on their own. They can contribute to the platform. And we also introduce a lot of automated tests because these data assets are registered, the metadata is known, and there is a huge improvement that we can do. So this is like the full journey of how we switch experimentation from thinking like the monolithic way to the data product way. And I will leave you now to, yeah, I will leave you now to Natalie, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, so for me, data management and data literacy are really two sides of the same coins. They, they are both about helping an organization maxim maximize value from data, and they're both about helping an organization broaden access to data. And they both require also a lot of change management and adoption from a top-down and bottom-up level. Uh, next slide, please. Chris. Making sense of data and putting it to use across the organization means that everyone must be able to use data effectively. As data and analytics becomes a core part of any digital business transformation and data becomes an organizational asset, employees must have at least the basic ability to communicate, understand, and have a conversation about data, ensure the ability to speak data. Therefore, data literacy is an essential part of a data-driven culture and a key pillar for data management. And this is why at HelloFresh, we are embracing data democratization, where all of our data users can easily access and understand data. In addition to widespread data literacy, achieving data democratization requires a new approach of managing data. And I will explain that in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. So the, the data literacy uh, program started as a small experiment for analysts on how to better build dashboards. And one of, an, of our analysts, um, she basically took the task of creating contents and workshop to the next level and her name was Lydia. So Lydia started to create a whole data literacy program in a very fun, engaging way with badges, hall of fame and certification. And the program received a huge amount of adoption. And we saw this as an opportunity to drive change through the data literacy program by investing in our people's overall data capabilities and our data driven culture therefore strived. And we, we were able to reach every single uh, people within our organization. As a result, we were able to teach and implement new procedures uh, much faster. So how does it look today? So we're using and leveraging all type of channels of communications and knowledge exchange in order to build our new data culture from creating workshops to having open sessions. So whether they're either one-to-one -one or classrooms, Greek Fridays and Slack channels. 
And we are supporting uh, all of our teams and our employees by creating and building useful tools and contents. And we are addressing the needs of our people, the type of topics they would like to see, and therefore making learning fun and engaging again. So hopefully we've given you an insight on how HelloFresh is building its data strategy. Uh, and as mentioned by Christoph earlier, please do check out our job boards. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Um, Scott, are you taking over? Go well, first. I was just going to say thank that that was an awesome presentation. And uh, we're, we've got the Q&A uh, here. And as I said, people can throw in their, their questions in there and they're, they're uh, voted. Um, you know, you can vote on whatever you'd like to, to, to see the, the team answer. Um, I am going to use uh, my uh, position to, to ask my, one question I've got first, which uh, was a lot about what Natalie was talking about, about data literacy. I mean, it's awesome that you created your own um, kind of internal platform around that. That's that's awesome. You know, we'd love to talk with with uh, you about how you we could kind of spread that so other people could potentially do some things like that. But um, one question about that is is how much is meeting you know, the people within the organization where they are versus upskilling and training and, and things like that. You know, one of the things that, that I didn't necessarily see, maybe you did, you did put on the, the slide was um, how are you actually like training the people in addition to that? Or are you just making sure that they can, with their current skill set, do what they need to do? Yeah, so I mean, like I said, right, Lydia was really the, the person who's built the whole data literacy program, and she was very instrumental uh, in building doubt and fleshing it out at, at HelloFresh. Uh, but it's really understanding the needs of, you know, what is required from a skill set when it comes to data and, and putting uh, the right learnings and training together. Um, Oh, awesome. that makes sense. Scott. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to let you folks uh, run with, with the q and I, I might jump in uh, a little bit on um, with, with some different things, but I'll let the, the community ask. But the, the data literacy thing, what you're doing there is really impressive. Even the there was a job description that kind of got me in, connected with you folks of what, you know, you're, you're really focused on there has, has been super awesome so I'm, I'm i want to learn more and i want i want to interview you potentially for a uh, a blog post or something around that i just want to jump in on on this data literacy uh, topic because uh when i first joined hellofresh i was really very impressed uh by this because i i myself tried to uh implement that in my previous organization and and i can eh, it's it's a huge huge challenge but what I can add on to, to what Natalie said is that in the data literacy program, there are different paths uh, according to what kind of um, level that you are in understanding data. So you have like your beginners, you have your in intermediate, and then you have your ex ex experts. And I think just curating this path itself, I can imagine that it was, it was a lot of effort, a lot of uh, research uh, done into it. So it's, it's really... I mean, I'm at HelloFresh, so maybe I have a bias, but I really think that it's a really good program. Well, and and uh, Adavinta just, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat, but Ad, Adavinta just posted um, a, a blog post about this. Sorry, you just said the beginner and the, the intermediate and the advanced that they've got um, sample notebooks for all of their data products and stuff that, and one of their, their focuses is having that kind of beginner notebook and that intermediate and that advanced notebook so that that you you can cater to all of those so I think I think you're you've got a, a great um, approach to it and it's also becoming kind of a standard as well so so it's uh, it's it's great so again I'll I'll I'll, I'll be quiet now sorry I'll, I'll, <laughs> you folks go ahead and run the, the Q&A however you want so maybe we just start yeah so maybe I can Go ahead. Yeah, I think I can take more of this question. Um, so um, before I actually answer, uh, just like name a couple of tools. Um, so it's maybe worth pointing out again, like the, the subtitle of this talk, it's a work in progress, right? So like one year ago, like we still had this 
analytical monoliths uh, with very poor uh, discoverability, no data quality controls. So um, we are on a journey. We're not we're not there yet. Um, and that's also uh, that the reason why most of our tools are still um, centralized because like decentralizing everything right from the beginning would have totally overwhelmed the organization. So, um, and before I actually talk about the tools, it's, I think it's also important to understand that um, I feel that we already got most of the benefit uh, through enabling the individual teams. So, um, and that all also works with, with centralized or part, partly centralized tools. So to give you an example of how that looks like uh, for, for data ingestion, um, um, and let, let's pick, pick data quality as an example. So what we're, what you as a data producer, you are owning, you're, you're the owner of some microservice um, that is emitting some, some operational data. So you, you wanna share that with the rest of the company, you go to the data ingestion gateway, you edit the configuration file where you say, okay, like please connect to this database um, and uh, ingest that table every hour into my, into my bucket in, in, in the data lake so that everyone can access it. Um, and, um, and you wanna, because you're the data producer, you're owning the quality of the data asset. Uh, you wanna ensure that uh, the data that is reaching the, 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 the that, you're, that you're publishing, that you're exposing to the rest of the organization, that this is meeting some, some quality standards. So you can configure your, your data quality checks, like trivial ones like, that there should be no null in that column, but it can also, you can also of course check for, um, uh, for, for, for uh, what's the word? So like changes over time so that there is a, a, a like unusual high numbers or something like that. Um, so this is what you own that configuration. But centralized is the execution of that. So like we as the data platform team, we are picking up your configuration. Um, we are running it against the data. And in this case, now I actually talk about the tools. Um, we, we, we can do this with, you can implement this with an open source tool like Great Expectations. You can think of a, a software as a service solution like Soda.io for data quality um, that provides like a nice shiny user interface uh, but even if you have a centralized user interface that, that everyone in the company can can access, still you as a data producer, you have your own space in that which you're owning, um, which you can expose to your data customers and say like, if you wanna consume my data, here's, um, here's the place where you can find the information about the data quality of that. Um, we do something similar with, 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 with the data, uh, with, with discoverability, so we have a, centralized data catalog, very classical, uh, using Informatica here. For data privacy, we are, we're not even having the tools. So um, there again, and I, maybe I can answer that because there was a question down there, which was, uh, um, uh, yeah, kind of connected to that. So um, again, when you're the data producer, you're configuring that you wanna ingest data into your bucket, into the data lake, you can define in an easy way and say like, well, this field contains um, sensitive private information. So this is, uh, and I wanna hash it. Um, again, you're defining it where the platform is, um, is, is taking care of, 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 of executing that configuration. And then we are storing uh, a, a raw copy of the data um, which is not accessible uh, for everyone in the organization um, and uh, anonymized copy, um, uh, which is accessible by everyone. Um, and that of course is duplicated with storage, um, but this is not so much a problem for HelloFresh because we're not particularly dealing with petabytes here. So, um, and this is maybe one to, to to close this statement um, for data privacy and for data quality, we both also like in a centralized way, we're also making sure that there are interfaces um, to, to a data governance function so that um, some, some compliance manager can check what data gets anonymized. Um, they can check who is accessing that data. Um, 
also data governance is interested in understanding like how much data quality checks are in place and if data quality across the organization is going up or down. So um, this is uh, how we have set that up. I, I hope that was answering your question. If not, uh, please uh, uh, chime in again and uh, ask, ask it again. Thanks, Mario. I'm more than happy to take the second one, which is essentially what our domains teams doing, which do not have actually data engineering. Um, where do I start? I would like to start with, um, we need to, we have to acknowledge, right? If we want to build software project, a product that we need to have engineers, right? And I think that is a kind of situation that we have faced in the beginning is we had a centralized team, which was kind of a, a bottleneck because of the hyper growth of this company. And people have started building basically their, soft, their software product actually in isolation, which led us to a, a lot of technical debt. And this is no bad intent, right? It's just that you need certain capabilities for, uh, for certain jobs. That's why we have these kind of distinction, right? So when we started actually distributing our centralized teams, which was uh, responsible for all the different pipelines that we had in the, in the company towards more distributed system, the first thing that we had to do is actually staffing the teams properly with, with data engineers on the one side. And I think one thing, what I'm saying implicitly is there are two types of teams in a classical sense, right? You have the analytical teams who are very aware of the, under, uh, of the importance of analytical data, right? There's, no real need actually to explain uh, analytical teams what is uh, what is why is this important for the business because we expect this team to have this business uh, acumen. Um, however, on the engineering side, there's a lot of things right for 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 engineering things that actually need to be done by people who have actually professionalized in this area and have spent a lot of time to understanding how best what are the best data engineering uh, or engineering uh, capabilities or best practices in general. So, and. Then we have the software engineering uh, teams who are staffed with, uh, with engineers, have the best practice in terms of engineering, but they are kind of disconnected from the business uh, data value that we're having. So we need to actually address these two things differently. And uh, for that question more, I would like to target on the analytical sides, as mentioned, is that we need to basically to enable people uh, to take care of the data assets, meaning that they also have to have uh, data engineers in, the, in their group. And this was a difficult situation. I think that is why we're hiring still. And this is kind of probably the, the one of the biggest challenges here. If you start redistributing that to the different domains, you need to make sure that you have actually people in that domain who can take ownership of that. And we, we have done this by different things. Yes, hiring, I mentioned multiple times already, but the second piece is also that we started actually distributing some of the people that we had in the core team into the domain team and starting with senior people who are actually building the team around that. And we started on a small scale, right? We not actually distributed in each and every subdomain first, but actually identify the three biggest pillars of our company, which is the supply chain. It's about the digital product itself and it is about marketing. And we started basically staffing these analytics teams first, and we are slowly now basically rolling that out step-by-step step to the uh, different individual functions. That also means that there are still some leftovers basically on the central team to help and teach and, and work on. But actually the idea of starting very roughly with uh, understanding what are roughly the high level domains where we're distributing the people, staff them properly and let them actually take it over and then actually break it down into more smaller teams with actually having enough people who and also can take care of that. And there is actually a need of breaking it further down. That's being said, uh, maybe Syria, do you want to take the next one? Sure, uh, I can take the next question. So it's, how do you start defining data products? What is the process for it? So fun fact, I am actually one of the first data product managers uh, at, at HelloFresh. And when I came in, uh, these data products already existed. So um, I haven't had the opportunity so far to actually define a data product, but I would imagine that what I did when I first came in is more or less the same process on how we would define data products. So we always start with first, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What is the, the business impact um, that's neat? Uh, what's the business impact of this product? What, what's, what's the business problem that, that, that we, we, or challenge that we need to address? And, and from there, uh, come up with uh, the idea uh, behind it and, and really evaluate uh, the, the effort that's needed to, to build it and maintain it, and also what kind of impact that it would have financially uh, on, on the business. 
So from there, then, then we start to, to design it and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at, Hello, at HelloFresh, we have a formal process called uh, RFC, which is re request for comments, where the person who has this idea or, did, or, or uh, would like to, to add an enhancement to, to a product would have to write a formal document and have it reviewed by um, our peers uh, at HelloFresh. So, but always I would say what is essential to defining a data product is number one, what's, what's the, the, the uh, problem or challenge that it's trying to solve and how is it the data that's going to be used uh, to solve it? I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Surya. We have an interesting question about metadata, Harry. Yeah. So yes, so uh, for this one, it is federated for us. Like uh, uh, the reason being is that if it were uh, at a data product level, uh, then discovery outside that scope would be a problem. So it has to be more context aware. So it's 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 a it federated fashion for us. I sorry, I actually did have a question around that of. Where do you actually have the documentation live? Is the documentation purely living in the data catalog, or does the documentation live at the data product level, and then it is it is automatically in some form or fashion pushed into or pulled into the data catalog? Because I think that that's one yeah. thing where a lot of people it's a nuance, but people are really interested in that yeah. that kind of uh, approach as to uh, yeah. are you just forcing people to go into yet another screen versus they can document their metadata in code. And then that code gets pulled into the, the data product or into the data catalog. So maybe I can, I can take that because that's related actually, actually to a different question that we had around lineage, right? I think uh, to be honest, as mentioned, we, all the, we are on a journey. And I think most of the, uh, the process that we start in the, in the first place are very manual, right? And we have our central data catalog, meaning that we actually currently mostly also doing it in a manual way. However, how you can imagine how what we what we have tried already with with data lineage, for example, is that is something that you want to actually have automated as much as possible, right? You, if you want to understand where uh, the data is coming from, that should not be actually uh, be error busy due to human errors that you're actually not uh, fixing it correctly. So there is certain tooling which is provided by Informatic in our case, which basically gives some pieces of the lineage already, and um, then actually on top of that. We built. We started building actually in-house tooling for not just capturing these pieces, but also uh, building the rest of the pieces around what we have built around MedViews and what we have built around the ETLs. And currently, that is actually the first example of which is going the direction you have mentioned. We want to have this documentation as close as possible, right? Because the data, the data product itself, consists of the code, but also of the of the documentation. And we also want to make it as easy as possible for for the data engineers to basically deal with the, with the tools that they know, right? We don't want to actually um, creating more overhead and having different people, different roles that needs to be synchronized in order to document this data asset. So if a, a, data, um, a data engineer in a team is basically implement, is responsible for the implementation, has an understanding around the SLO that they can guarantee, understand which kind of data assets are actually used to produce this data asset, and also the, the rest of the documentation, our idea would be that this can actually live as close as possible as a config file close to the pipeline, which is uh, creating that data asset by also ingesting more metadata, like for example, when was it last updated, who's the owner? And this is actually very close to the team who is producing it and it's very close to the code of actually producing the data asset. So long story short, uh, still a lot of manual work on our side, but the, the idea would be that we're pushing that as close as possible to the, to the code itself and automate it as much as possible. Scott, awesome. is it answering your question? Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. And, and uh, one comment I would have is that it seems like a lot of the uh, core team and the things that you're providing to your people are are highly uh, empathetic. Where you're you're thinking of, uh, and it's something that I think a lot of people who are succeeding with data mesh are doing as well. Of of how much can we reduce the toil because this is a transition. It's a journey. It's difficult to move from where you were to where you're going. So I, I think everything that's coming through is that a lot of what you're doing is very 
highly around, we want to reduce the strain on our people and we want to centralize everything we can. So things are less and less manual. So I really, I really, that resonates well with me. So <laughs> thanks. Cool. Sharif, I can, I can do take you want to take the one? Yeah, yeah. So how do the developers handle testing and validating changes? Do you build smaller test data sets? So in general, I would say we handle that in a typical way. First of all, in a, in a way where how how sort of things are typically handled in the, in software engineering by by putting a, a proper CI/CD pi pipeline with a, with a higher high test coverage. So whenever I implement certain things and push it to a certain branch, then um, you know tests are executed. It will be checked if um, if my tests are still running, if um, my code style is correct, and the same also when I kind of integrate my code somewhere. Um, and yeah, part of those tests is also to run tests against smaller test data sets. And, um, and that way we also make sure that, you know, the transformations that we do, for example, um, for, for Spark, we make sure that, you know, the output of the data sets is, are still the same. And in this future, we will also um, have more reliability, reliability due to data quality checks. And then we also make sure that whenever we do something that we run our data quality checks, to make sure on a higher level that um, that the data quality remains the same um, when changing things, so changing transformations and code. Yeah, I would like to add there that the way also you create your test really matters, right? Because I think like if you really take this approach of like, I have an input, I compare to an expected output, uh, it works initially, right? But it's very naive. So if you then try to get the properties of your output, right? You know, I want to check, for example, that in case of experiment, for this experiment, it's a probabilistic model. So I always want to check that the variation A is winning compared to B, right? I, I don't need to know the exact output. I need to have like the properties of the output. So if you get these qualities of your output, then you run them in production and you have data quality test out of the box, right? So it's like if we, when you shift to this mindset, you immediately start like having a, a more maturity in your quality in the quality of your output and even like easier to shift them to production. We have another interesting question from Bart around uh, how do you convince business people to take ownership on data if it only introduces extra work? Uh, I have a very strong opinion about that, but uh, Natalie. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and answer it. Um, so from my perspective, right, if I take an example, let's say that you are sitting in the finance or marketing team and you are building a, a product and, you know, you own one of those data domain. Um, I wouldn't call it it's extra work. I think it's part of your job and your responsibility. So if you're building a product, you own it and therefore you're responsible for, for the life cycle of it, right? It's, it's like... Uh, it's like a developer saying, I'm going to build something, but I'm not going to, to do the queue and, you know, I'm not going to do any testing on it. So as long as you own a data domain or a specific product, um, you are responsible for it end to end. So you're responsible in terms of, does it fit consumer's requirement? Is it going to, to add value? Um, I know a lot of people do see it as extra work. I just think it's part of... Um, of the responsibility of the person who owns the data to manage it end to end is what I would say. I don't know, Christoph, if you want to add anything. Yeah, uh, I'm, I like this question very much because I think there's also not a solved piece on, on our side, but essentially yeah. what it entails is um, how do we create incentive for teams to actually build data product that they share with others, right? Because you can't actually pick a, a, a random team and this team is saying, okay, if I keep this data internally and only fulfilling the need of my, my core stakeholders in sense, what is my incentive of actually putting more extra work in that and actually start coming with, oh, I need to establish data, uh, data contracts, for example. I have to do a proper documentation. I also may actually have to be on call to make sure that this data is, is available. And so what is actually the, the incentive? What, how can we create incentive, right? And there, I think two pieces. Um, when we're not creating incentive, right, we can actually solve this by, uh, by certain policies and say, hey, you have to do that. However, I think there's also something which is around creating incentive uh, in terms of transparency, right? If you think about, um, in the end, 
we have the, the overall goal for analytics, right, is that we are pre uh, presenting certain reports to our, our management that can make decisions based on and steering the operations. If we actually get to a place where we can have, let's say, data quality tiering present at that level already automated, of course, because we love that, uh, through all the different stages, where it becomes very visible for the end user, what are actually certain data quality concerns? And they can choose depending on like for in this pandemic in the beginning where quick decision making is very important. Yes, it's fine. It's clear that we cannot provide highest quality in a in, in very short amount of time. But however, if you're talking about um, um, reports that actually stand for quite a while, we could make sure that, okay, or basically I, I, I'm pretty convinced that basically our management will ask for high quality data if this is very visible for that. And if this thing is automated, uh, this tackles down to the domains, right? And at some point, uh, some, some domain, uh, but someone is approaching you and saying, hey, you are owning, you're responsible for the source of truth in this case. And we need that to make the, uh, to fulfill basically what management is asking us. So from that perspective, I think um, that may can help to basically understand, okay, who, who is responsible for which sources for which uh, which, are, which are important for the business and then actually starting to to share this in a broader group through uh, increasing transparency on the product so maybe i can can add one one i think powerful hack to 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 create incentives for data producers to produce high quality data and, and own those data assets so um I think it's very helpful if you help them understand how their data is consumed by whom so what value that data is providing to others so and that of course you can solve that by throwing a lot of technology at it but if, if you can also start with just simply connecting those people like um kind of having a, a user interview between the data producer and the data consumer so like those things can be really really powerful and they can uh, can be valuable when you want to create an incentive to um, exhibit ownership. Cool. Um, next question is from Dennis. Thanks for the presentation. Yes, thank you very much for listening. What's the place of a BI team which performs cross domain analysis and data mesh picture? Do, you, do they still need centralized data warehouse like hosts? Who wants to pick that? Harry, maybe? Yes. Uh, so currently, like uh, as uh, we said, like we we still in a process of uh, moving towards a data mesh. So the current way these kind of cross domain analysis is being done through uh, materialized views um, on top of uh, the data and the data lake. Uh, but uh, in the future, what we intend to do is uh, we intend to create some hyper specialized cubes, and uh, these cubes will in turn inundate multiple. Uh, smaller uh, virtualized uh, uh, queries of sorts, which will span across multiple uh, domains. So that that that's uh, our idea. Uh, the next one as well, I can take up. Uh, I yeah, to use. Yes, yes, we do. Like uh, so, currently we have a, a setup uh, which uh, uh, one take one abstracts the ingestion so we have an ingestion as a service we have a compute as a service basically we reuse uh, ems infrastructure to run any kind of compute needs uh, on spark or otherwise as well and uh, for exploratory analysis we have a presto as a service uh, so which which kind of uh, like uh, is limited uh, only for uh, the raw layer and the data lake and uh, we use this as a kind of a tool to further model the data uh, per per domain um yeah and and uh, uh, and finally like we also for the orchestration piece uh, for each of the teams we have uh, airflow running on kubernetes as a service as well i would i would like to add something in here um so it depends also a little bit on on how um independent those um transformations and um things which needs to be implemented are actually from the domain. So we have certain things like, like Harry just mentioned, we have Airflow, we have an ingestion tool, and whenever it is very independent from the domain, um, we can just use something which, um, which is provided by um, the, um, the data foundation team. But sometimes it's also like, also like that, that certain um, transformations and processes needs to be 
or have customized codes. And for that, we, um, we kind of built our own transformations in the domain, but we really make sure that we uh, are still using the same tools. So custom transformations, domain specific transformations from time to time, but still using something like Apache Spark or a custom way of ingesting data, but still using something like Kafka. Cool. Um, I've seen that we actually skipped one one question from uh, uh, from from Jim, and maybe yes, uh, Mario is right that we basically cannot share all the kind of internals. However, maybe maybe on a certain level we can answer that. Um, the question was if we basically scaling up two times in terms of personal and four times in terms of data. What current processes related to the data platform would stand and which would break down feel pressure? Um, that's a that's a good question. I think it's a little bit less actually about the platform, right? Because everything is kind of in the cloud and it's actually built for, for scaling and with the idea of distributing it. Um, I think that is um, that is actually something that we are proactively working on to avoid that. However, it's, however what I think is crucial is the governance aspect of it, right? That we're making sure that we are not actually running into a scenario where all the kind of distributed teams become silos, meaning that we are missing kind of an understanding what kind of different data is actually used by, by whom and what are the underlying sources that I, I should actually should use. And I think on that on that data, as it's just coming back to the to the discussion that we had before, I think scaling up for us means that we need to basically investigate much more on setting the right light touch governance frameworks for how do how do we create data and how we're operating it. And on, on, on top of that, I think it's mostly around automation. For example, if you're talking metadata, that we are also distributing this kind of breaking things out in, into the different functions. And maybe one thing on the platform itself, we are providing services, right? And if you take, for example, orchestration as a service, we are not providing a central solution for that, but actually all the means that the people need to spin up their own instances. So we're not just distributing um, basically the uh, the data itself, but also the infrastructure belonging to that. Mario, anything that you want to add? No, I good, I think. Um, I can take that one as a skill set. <laughs> like what's the skill set that you expect from the domain teams and you should be expert in expert. Um, I think like all of them have been said uh, that uh, we're trying to build services, right? We're trying to build a managed platform and we're trying to build abstractions on top. And this is very interesting because like different teams have different skill sets. So we don't expect everybody to be a data engineer in every, in every team, but also depends on the criticality, right? Like Christo have mentioned. So some critical services will get more data engineers than, than others. One thing it's like, not everybody needs to be an, uh, an expert in a Spark. Because again, we can create abstractions, right? And actually like we want to actually create like data democracy. So people should be able to get it at the right level that, or they need. So you can even get like a, any backend engineer and we have already a, a couple of abstractions that they can just like, you know, use configurations, use like minimal code. And then they can just uh, like run a Spark jobs without previous knowledge of a Spark. So I think we have also different layers for analysts that, you know, they're mostly speak SQL, let's say. So they can still run uh, like, you know, high performance transformations or like even with high volumes at, uh, just by using SQL and using like a small configuration file. So maybe maybe to, I can add uh, an example to that um, because um, so we're, we as a platform, uh, as a data platform, um, we're providing different tools for different skill sets as well. So we have um, the, 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 the fully controlled uh, airflow, uh, or air, airflow that is fully controlled by the domain data team. So they can scale it up, uh, they can do with it whatever they want, they have the full flexibility. For teams uh, who are not having the capabilities to do that, there is also a community airflow. So like that is not set up for very heavy workloads, but teams who are not having the capabilities to kind of orchestrate their own uh, airflow, they can they can use that. And then even for teams that are not having those capabilities, there are also um, other ways to, to build simple ETL like processes, like, like um, a, a managed MetView service um, that we're offering. So um, it's not a strict requirement for 
yeah, as Predro said, it's not a strict requirement for every team to have that data engineer, um, but the, the, the more complex a domain is, the more likely they are to have that, that capability in their team. And uh, I just wanted to, to jump in here briefly and, and say, you know, um, we're heading towards the end of our scheduled time here. I am happy to continue to go over if, if you, you all want to continue asking questions, but I also want to, you know, not uh, keep you too late here. So I'll let you all take care of what you want to do, but I wanted to, to just say that now in case uh, anybody's uh, feeling like they need a nap or, or dinner or anything like that. So um, I'll, again, you, you do, you do you, you take it however you want to go, but uh, I wanted to cut in here and, and uh, if anybody felt like they needed to, to drop out, that there's a, a, uh, I mean, a good excuse. <laughs> my suggestion would be if everyone is fine with that, that we're actually taking three more questions. And honestly, if you, if there's some burning question, reach out to us and we can also take that offline. I'll, and I'll copy the, the questions as well, even the ones that were answered and the ones that were unanswered. And uh, so we'll have a record of that. And if you want to help, uh, you know, in any way, you don't have to, but we will have a record of it. Awesome. Um, maybe quickly about the team size. Um, how big is the domain data team leaving out the data infrastructure engineers that support the domain? Is it always one to one data engineer uh, to domain team? Um, so it depends on the domain. And I think we have a minimum setup that, that we require and not just continuing the discussions that we had. In the beginning, we required actually data engineers in each team, right? So our current staffing and uh, Sharif, uh, Pedro, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but we typically have a setup of two, sometimes even three data engineers with one senior person and, so, and actually then more junior mid-level people to that. Um, depending on the domain, also data scientists, uh, quite often to actually basically yeah, build, let's say the more predictive analytics around that. And then uh, the, the typical uh, yeah, BI and data analysts on top of that. So if you count that together, I think that's a kind of normal team size around six, seven people. But basically if you start with one domain uh, and it becomes necessary to hire more people because you're specializing in your area, we typically break that down into smaller teams at this point. So yes, the answer I think is yes, we have Almost, yeah, I think we, we require or try to basically establish at least a one to one mapping between data engineers and could remain. Who wants to come with uh, Bart's question? How did you transform from the central bottleneck team to a self service data platform? When you are a bottleneck team, you already have lots of work to do. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, how do we do that? Um, I mean, we started with how do we do that? I mean, there are a lot of different kind of uh, things to say about that, but maybe the most important thing is make visible what actually the, the team is facing because the outside understanding is typically a platform team is something, okay, no one really recognizes until things are burning. And uh, when things are burning, it's typically too late. And I think in the beginning, the expectation of that team was mostly yeah, fulfilling the business needs and the individual domains and basically building the pipeline and data products for, for, for the rest of the business. And slowly but truly, this basically this request became more and more and more. Um, the team spent more and more time on actually uh, fixing technical debt. And on top of that, recognized by themselves that we actually need to modernize on our, our overall platform and started actually building the future, uh, the platform of the future. So these three things are because of different kind of principles. If you're talking about um, uh, team set, team setups in general um, and team topologies, that does not really work. So what have we done? I think the, the first attempt that we actually have done almost two years ago was recognizing this problem and saying, okay, we need to re reduce the mental load of the people in the team. Saying we are basically dedicating certain people. In, uh, in the domains uh, or basically in the central team towards uh, one domain, one of the core domains uh, on a part-time basis. And we tried this for a couple of months saying, okay, these people are now working in supply chains. These uh, people are supporting marketing and these people are uh, uh, focusing basically on our digital product. However, uh, it became very quickly apparent that when they started in the domain, they were also fixing the technical depth of this domain. Um, and actually slow down um, the actual work that they're trying to do in this team. So that's, this didn't really work. Uh, the thing what was good out of that is people build a lot of empathy of the actual work that the central team has to do. 
And um, also it was pretty easy now to get a lot of more advocates to say, hey, we need more data engineers and actually need to staff the teams to, to get there. That in turn actually requires a buy-in from the entire company top down, right? And we kicked that off um, last year in the beginning or actually even before that, that we actually made this very transparent that, that the current setup does not scale. Meaning um, that we started to identify and agree throughout the entire company that data is a precious asset for us. And this is something that we have to take care of and that we kicked off a global reorganization where we have said, okay, there is a lot of technical depth that we have to carry with. We started actually staffing the individual teams to take care of that. We, as mentioned, everything that we have discussed so far, also introducing data product management to introduce a, a product mindset, and then slowly actually uh, starting distributing that. But yes, uh, I think that is the most critical, uh, crucial piece. Okay. Uh, where's the data stored for exploration? Is it all in a single central store? What happens if when the conform dimension change? Do all data products have to ch have to change? Um, who wants to take that? Harry, maybe? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so as of now, like uh, the data is, is uh, we, we, we have uh, the data in, in a centralized raw layer, but uh, the ownership of this is uh, distributed. And uh, the uh, the way the conform dimension stay change is that we, we do not have use uh, snapshots of it, so they are more virtualized structures. So as and when the underlying conform dimensions change, the data products also change. Uh, so that, that's how we go about the, with this one. Cool. Okay, uh, Scott, before I hand over to you, basically saying, okay, how, how big is the size of the team working on the data mesh initiative? Uh, that's a very interesting question because um, we started in a very small group around two, three, four people. And I would argue that from now on, actually almost the entire company has actually bought into this domain. And like we are distributing the data products to the different domains, there's also this effort of actually making that happen. Uh, is basically all on the people who are working here, right? And I think that um, there, there's some steering committees uh, depending on the different kind of areas, but we have basically teams individually working on the governance aspect of that. We uh, kicked through basically this uh, uh, reorganization that was something around, uh, yeah, as mentioned, with buy-in from, from our CEO um, to basically make this change in a, in a group of five people. However, I think that is that is not the crucial part, right? I think the crucial part is that the entire company understands that, and that we can also distribute the change to a data mesh, uh, basically in the same way how we're distributing the data products. If there's nothing else from anyone here, um, Scott. Yeah, again, thank you so much, team. This has been awesome. I'm, you know, I've got plenty of, of follow-up questions that I, I might uh, ping you on on some of this stuff. But I'm I'm grabbing the uh, questions, both the answered and the unanswered. So we've got a record of that for people. And and if there are any that uh, the team uh, would like to answer offline, um, then we'll we'll have that as well. But again, uh, I do not put that expectation on my presenters. That's not fair for you. <laughs> You've already been so kind with your time and this has been great. Um, for uh, everybody, we will have a recording of this up. I hope to have it up tomorrow. Um, sometimes the computer takes 10x longer than it should. And I'm also very, very terrible at editing, even though I have to only pick off the front and the back. So, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'll uh, try and have that up. I'll, I'll post that to the meetup groups and, and things like that. But uh, if, if the HelloFresh team wants to do any kind of sign off, great. Otherwise we can end it there. Yes, from my side at least, and thank also for Mario. It was was a pleasure, basically, to talking to you. Thank you for all the interesting questions. It was really engaging. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, it has been fun. That was fun. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.